continue with our, first, our second reading for today. It's from Revelation, the 22nd chapter, the, um, because Pastor Nestigan is preaching on Acts uh, 16. So the second, uh, the second lesson is actually the first lesson for today, and it's from Revelation. See, I am coming soon. My reward is with me to repay according to everyone's work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they will have the right to the tree of life and may enter the gate, the city by its gates. It is I, Jesus, who sent my angel to you with this testimony for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. The spirit of the bride says, say come. Let everyone who hears say come. Let everyone who is thirsty come. Let anyone who wishes to take water, the water as a gift come. The one who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with all the saints. Amen. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Can I please have you stand for the gospel. <clears throat> Thank you. Jesus prayed, I ask not on, on, only on behalf of these, but also on behalf of those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one. As you, Father, are in me and I am in you, may they also be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The glory that you have given me, I have given them, so that they may be one as we are one. I ask in them, I, I in them, and you in me, they, uh, that they may become completely one, so that the world may know that you have sent me, and have loved them, even as you have loved me. Father, I desire that those, those also whom you have given me may be with me, where I am, to see your glory, which you have given me, because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Righteous Father, the, the world does not know you, but I know you. And these things that you have sent, sent, sent me, I made your name known to them, and I will make it known, so that the love with, with which you have loved me uh, may be in them, and I in them. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise Lord. Lord. Well, I gotta say once again, there's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place, and we know that it's the spirit of the Lord. Okay. Yeah. 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 Amen. We uh, last uh, Thursday was Ascension, and next Sunday is Pentecost, and these are historic times for us as uh, Saving Grace Lutheran Church. Uh, all through our adventure, uh, we've called, uh, we've talked about God moments. Uh, it's a God thing, we say. And uh, it seems like today's first lesson was a kind of a God thing, because if you listen carefully, it almost seems to describe somewhat uh, in a broad way our situation. So before I uh, preach this morning, I'm going to um, read for you that lesson, and I want you to listen carefully and think of all the variety of ways that it can apply to our lives at present here at Saving Grace Lutheran. From the 16th chapter, the Acts of the Apostles. One day, Luke writes, as we were going to a place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination. She brought her owners great deals of money by her fortune telling. She followed Paul and she followed us and she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this day after day. And finally, Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to her spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her at that very hour. And when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas. 
And they dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities, and when they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city, they're Jews, and they're advocating customs that we are not, not able to observe as Roman citizens. The crowd joined in attacking Paul and Silas, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods, and after they had been flogged, they threw them into the prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. So, following these instructions, he put them in the innermost cell and he fastened their feet in the stocks. Now listen. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns unto the Lord. And the other prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was an earthquake so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken. The walls fell down and immediately the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. And when the jailer woke and saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to commit suicide since he supposed that all his prisoners had escaped. And Paul shouted in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are here. The jailer called for lights and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and he said to them, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all within his household. And at that same hour of the night, they took them and they washed their wounds, Paul and Silas, and then the jailer and his entire family were baptized without delay and he brought them up into the house and he set food before them and he, he and his entire household rejoiced that they had become believers in the Lord. Now well, there's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. It was a humble little church in the uh, farm country of New Jersey. It had been there for centuries, actually. And, of course, over the years, the composition of the membership had changed dramatically, you know. Started out, you know, years and years, centuries ago, as a kind of a crude cabin in the woods. And then, then as the uh, people of the church became more prosperous, they built a very humble building. Actually, it was a, a, a very traditional country church. And as a kind of feature of the building, an architectural feature, there was a large wall in the front of the church that had set into it a cross. And it was made of field stone. And it reached from one side to the other and up and down from floor to ceiling. <coughs> And people admired that cross. It represented their humble, their humble uh, background. Years passed. Again, the composition of the membership changed. They, uh, they attracted an awful lot of people that were uh, kind of using their community as a bedroom community so that they could drive to their big, high, powerful jobs in the big city, you know. And it came a time when they were going to have an anniversary for their congregation and they decided that they were going to remodel their church. And being they had gotten kind of highfalutin and sophisticated, you know, they hired an architect to do a study of their building. Some of the, uh, some of the more uh, high-class folks in the congregation were kind of ashamed of that fieldstone cross. And they especially asked the architect if there was some way that that could be covered or removed or some such thing. The architect did his study, and when he delivered his report, he said, you can do anything you want to that building, except remove that wall. He said, well, that's a load-bearing wall. That's what holds your church up. It's like a pillar. The arms of the cross hold the roof and the, and the walls in place. And if you remove that cross, your church will be destroyed. That's what it means to live in a church 
without walls. Now, we've all had our own adventures with that recently, haven't we? We've, uh, not just the pastors, we fully understand that represented sitting here and standing in the foyer and so on are people who have all had unique experiences as we've discovered what it means to live in a church without walls. Now listen to the word of the Lord. Listen to the Acts of the Apostles. It's just, you know, for years and years and years, for 35 plus years as a pastor, I've read these Acts of the Apostle texts that come after Easter, and they've never meant that much to me until now. Suddenly these stories about Paul and Silas, and these stories about them casting out the spirit of divination and taking away the the riches that the owners of this slave girl would make. Suddenly, these stories of Paul and Silas being flogged and persecuted. Suddenly, these stories of them going into that jail and singing hymns and sharing the word of the Lord with the prisoners. Suddenly, these stories are real, that they lived in those days in, in a church without walls. And that we, too, have discovered what it means to have to live in a church without walls. Oh, we're surrounded by four walls provided to us by Randy Munt, and we will have our adventure, we will have our wilderness days, we will be a church in exile, and we will discover places where we can finally settle, And we, but we ought not ever lose sight of this experience. That's the strangeness of it, for me too, that for all that we feel that we've been challenged by, nevertheless, we feel huh, that there is an inherent in adventure involved in this that has taken us back to the vividness, to the reality of our faith in Jesus Christ. The other day, old John Schoen came by to see me. You know, he's an old Baptist pastor. He's been... He's worked with the jail ministry for years, you know, and he's now, now, you know, in his 90s, and he's had his own, you know, medical challenges to face. But he came by and he sat in our office up at Banbury Place and he prayed with me. I mean, if that wasn't an anointing, I'll tell you, I don't know what was. Huh? And he came and he told me this story. He said, your situation, Pastor Rolf, reminds me of the people of Israel when they wandered in the wilderness. And you can read about this in the 50th chapter of Genesis and in the 13th chapter of Exodus and in the 24th chapter of Joshua. And you can read about how they promised Joseph. Remember how Joseph was sold into slavery and went down to Egypt and then happened to coincidentally be the very... Pharaoh's right-hand man that could help the Israelites to survive their bondage in Egypt, they made a promise to Joseph that they would carry his body out with them from, the, from Egypt into the promised land and that they would bury him there. And Pastor Sean, as he told me this story, he said, that's what you are doing. You are carrying the promise of God. It may feel dead to you, but it has life. Every time the people of Israel got into a particular situation where they felt challenged and there was a crisis for them, they, they reminded themselves of their promise to Joseph who had, had, had made them promise that he would take, they would take his body back to Canaan and bury it. And it inspired them. That's how the lives of all the people, all the saints that we have known live in us. Though they're dead, they give us inspiration. They remind us that we can live in a church without walls. That we can live inside with the faith that Christ has inspired, that the Spirit comes amongst us. That we, can, we in the midst of, a, of imprisonment, so to speak, can, can sing the hymns of glory to the Lord. That we can know, too, what it means. Old Pastor Sean, he said, you know, I've heard this before, and you probably heard it before, but it meant so much when he said it. He said, you know, in Chinese, the word for crisis is two, two kind of figures, and one means danger, and one means opportunity. And we have discovered for ourselves that crisis for us as a congregation has 
become not just dangerous to us, but also an opportunity. An opportunity to reclaim for ourselves the reality of our faith, to live in the light of God's word, and to hold fast to that word, and to recognize over and over and over it's a God thing. It's not always what I desire or what you desire, but it is God leading us in a direction that we don't always want to go. And we live this faith here with one another. The relationships that we have to one another, the joy that we have found. You see, people consistently ask me, how are you doing, Pastor? How are you doing? And I say, I'm doing fine as long as all of you are doing fine. As long as you, too, hear the call. Last Tuesday morning, I went over to Faith Lutheran Mission Congregation. All kinds of pastors from northwest Wisconsin, we call them, I suppose, orthodox or confessional pastors, they gathered around me. I just sat there drinking coffee and, and eating rolls, you know, and they took me. <laughs> They, they took me upstairs when I was foundering and on, and, uh, and they sat me down in a chair. Pastor Hansler sat me down in a chair, and they laid their hands upon me, and they prayed. They prayed. I felt like I had been ordained all over again. You see, I walked out of a convenience store, and a, and a uniformed policeman walks up to me, and he says, Is it true? I can't believe it. Is it true? And we stood and we had a chuckle about things, but we also, I mean, people in this community can't believe what we have faced and what we are facing, but we have done it together. And we have learned what it means to be a church without walls. And we've discovered in ourselves resources we didn't even know we had. You know, <laughs> just imagine what a great scriptural inspiration to hear of Paul and Silas singing praises to the Lord in jail. And then the walls fall down and they stay right there because they are a witness. They are a witness to the other inmates. They are a witness to the jailer and to his family who are then baptized. Is it, is it too far gone in this day and age that we cannot turn our lives outward to others and say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord? You see? I mean, this is what it means. And it's not just, you know, I, my brother and sister-in-law, after last Sunday, they sat right back there during the whole worship service. They come over to my house and we had a quick lunch and he was off to Edmonton and I don't know where she was going. But they looked at us and they looked at Sandy and they looked at me. And they said, you have a great congregation. I didn't meet one person there that was whining and crying about their situation. They were saying, what are we going to do now? It's an adventure. Because we have a church without walls. And we have a place where we can sing the, sing the praises of God. And they can hear us too. And we stand firm. We stay right in this place where we are. I don't mean literally. I mean in spiritual in spiritual inspiration we come to stand before the Lord and to give witness to others to have that guy walk up to you at a convenience store and say is it true I can't believe that such a thing could happen and to say yes it's true but have you heard about my Lord he's got a strange sense of humor <laughs> you know kind of like old Dr. Seuss used to say oh the places you'll go Huh? Yeah. The places you'll go. Because God just grabs you by the scruff of the neck. My mom used to take me by the ear. Ooh. <laughs> That's for you mothers here today. <laughs> it's my only reference to Mother's Day. But, you know, boy, if she really wanted to get my attention, she'd take the hair on the back of my neck and pull it against the grain. Ooh, does that hurt. <laughs> but God takes us by the scruff of the neck and he teaches us to be his own, and to, to witness to others. We have joy. We have certainty. We have faithfulness. We have commitment. We have what God wants in his people. 
whether we're sitting in a funeral home or finding another place that we can we can gather around to sing the praises of God and we can have our feet in the stocks too in a certain sense but we can say we are glad to be a church without walls we have learned from this experience and that's the truth of this text that comes alive in our presence this very day. Huh? The scriptures can mean more now to you. I suggest to all of you that you pick up your Bible and read, and you'll be so surprised at how these variety of texts speak to you in our situation. You know, when um, our youngest daughter met um, Arlen Solom, he's the son of uh, Kermit Solom down there, pastor down in Maliba. And when they met, she brought him home, you know. And I thought, you know, I had to be the dutiful father. And I knew that they were heading for the altar, you know. And so I, I looked at him and I said, uh, you know, Arlen, it's a big responsibility to get married. You know, what are you going to do to make sure that there's food on the table? He said, the Lord will provide. I said, That's fine, I said. Uh, what about... Uh, what what about paying off your school debts? He said, the Lord will provide. I said, what about transportation? What about clothing? What about all these things? What, what, what about when you start a family? And all the rest, he said, the Lord will provide. And I walked in the other room and my wife said, what do you think of Arlen? I said, well, he's a nice guy, but he thinks I'm the Lord. <laughs> You know, I used to say that myself. The Lord will provide. I thought they were just words. I thought they were just print on a page. But I'll tell you something. Ever since April 24th, when I say the Lord will provide, and it's a God thing, I know it's true. And so do you. You know why? Because we're a church without walls. Amen. Number 25. Number 25 was our hymn.